Your black legend, Murray Mixter, joins us. Mix, welcome back. Good morning. Good morning. How are you, Martin? Oh, look, I'm well. I sh- think I should be feeling a little bit more sour. I'm not sulking like I normally do over an all black loss. I don't know why. <laughs> well, I guess you've got to expect one a year. We did two. About 12 we? Months. We've had two. We, we lost to the Lions as well, remember? So, in that second test. Well, that's right. That's right. Actually, I forgot about that. I forgot about that. Yeah, I was thinking of the game against Ireland and uh, Chicago, which was about 12 months ago. But I think that if you, um, you know, I mean, this, this All Black selection panel have, have got a mandate, haven't they, to develop, well, now they've named a squad of 37, so it's to develop a team of 37. Um, and so to do that, you've got to play players uh, in, the, in the heat of Test Match Rugby against the best. And so if you're going to change your team, six or seven players, you know, every, every test match, you're going to come unstuck at some stage, especially if you take some key players, um, you know, out of their roles. And for the last decade, this All Black side has been about operating under pressure, um, executing, sorry, executing under pressure. So in other words, um, placing, placing pressure on the opposition or turning over a ball um, or, you know, a mistake made by the opposition, exploiting that mistake, um, punishing that mistake, I should say. And that's been the sort of the plan, really, for the last decade. And, um, and it's seen us grow as a, as a rugby nation. We're probably stronger now than we've ever been in the history of New Zealand rugby. It's set a standard for super rugby. It's set a standard for um, Mitre 10 Cup. Uh, and I dare say it sets a standard at club level too. It, it, it affects the game right throughout, and it's uh, and it's marvellous. However, it, it, you can't you can't do it forever when you're changing three, you know, a third or half of your team each week. And uh, I think this this side, um, you know, I watched that game pretty carefully, and it appeared to me that in the first half, the uh, the game plan was to kick more than normal and to play the game inside the Wallaby territory. And that's fine uh, if that's your game plan. But really, it still boils down to decision-making, doesn't it? Um, You know, when you run and when you kick. When is the time to run and when is the time to kick? And I think that's what the difference was this weekend. You know, and we we lost our way in that area. I think we, you know, I spoke about the the Springbok team last week. Yes, you did. Or two weeks ago, about how much ball they waste. You know, how much ball they waste at their forwards in. You know, they grind away and they produce ball and they waste it. Well, you know, it was history repeating itself with New Zealand this time because I thought we were beaten in the backs, not in the forwards. And really, we we beat ourselves in many respects. And uh, I think our decision-making was poor. Now, the other thing that happened that was quite interesting, I mean, and, but you've got, to ha- you've got to give credit to the Australians yep. because... You know, the all-black team had a, had a game plan, but so did the Australians. So what was the Australian game plan? Well, you know, if you analyse an opposition team and work out how to beat them, you'd have to come up with a conclusion that this all-black side does like to move the ball wide, does like to create space out wide, because we've got a lot of strike power out there, and we score good tries, and that's what we're trying to do. Um, Steve Hansen says time and time again, we want to play attractive rugby. So attractive rugby is not around you know, nine or ten man rugby. It's actually using the width of the field. So you're the Wallabies, you're Michael Checker and the boys, you know, and they're not dumb. They sit down and analyse the, the game and they say, how can we turn this around? Are we, gonna, are we good enough to beat them of spreading the ball to the, the sides, you know, and playing a similar sort of a game? Well, they haven't... History's shown recently that they haven't been good enough, so they had to do something to change it. So what they did is they use this rush defence of putting real pressure uh, on our back line and even having a player from the outside coming in into that hole, sort of looking for the big wide pass that we threw again on the weekend that was intercepted and scored at the other end, rather similar to the first test against the Wallabies in the Bledisloe Cup. So they were, they got out to a good start. Uh, and in other words, it was their game plan that was effective. It effectively shut us down. Our back line wasn't operating as well as it has in the past. Uh, the, the decisions weren't made as, as, as well as they have been in the past. And the Australians capitalised on it and good on them. The other thing that actually happened, Martin, that, uh, that surprised me was in the second half because, you know, 
you've got a time to take a breath at half time and you've got guys like Hanson that have seen everything that I'm talking about at the moment uh, plus of course and because uh, I've got lots of aides you know um, showing them and uh, giving them stats etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but what actually happened in the second half is that we it appeared to me that we lost the confidence uh, to attack when it was on you know when is an all black team sort of kicked the up and under or the Gary Owen or whatever you want to call it instead of looking to spread the ball. And I think that some of our players lost a bit of confidence. Some of our newer players lost a bit of confidence in that game. Um, they had to go early on the first half and the second half they weren't quite so confident so they put the ball high in the air. Um, you know, and that's a 50-50 call then once you do that. You, you know, you pass over power to, the, to almost uh, he who... Uh, he who recovers best gets it, you know. It's like giving the opposition a chance again. So, you know, that's my summation of what happened. Well, is part of that because you're forced into making errors because their tackling was aggressive? I mean, for the first time, they put us down and they kept putting us down. Max, you, you texted me and you said it sorts out the men from the boys because you always say, what is a test? A test is a test. So explain that. <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? <laughs> no doubt about it. Well, you think the Springbok uh, team wasn't putting us down and, and crunching tackles like that? Exactly yes, what they, they were. Yep. Of course they were. They were doing exactly the same thing, and that's a test match. You know, that's a true test match. And I think the key really to um, to a successful um, reign, I suppose, and it's the, the, the Hanson reign at the moment, is to pick the moments when you can change players and still get the same result you're looking for. And, um, you know, there's there's horses for courses, aren't there? Uh, and I think maybe in some respects we, we were a bit unlucky with, with injuries and uh, unavailabilities um, and were forced maybe into playing um, several players in the back line that, that aren't our number one players in their positions. Including the number 10, how, how important now is that? And is Bowden the first, second, third, fourth and fifth pick now? Is he that much ahead yeah. of everyone else? I don't think it's just the number 10, to be frank. Um, I think it was, I don't think that the number one player in New Zealand was playing 10, 12 or 13. Um, that's my view, or 15. Um, so, you know, that means if they're not the one, number one player, then there's somebody better. Now, you know, if you look at selections over the last, you know, season, you'd have to say Bowden Barrett's probably your best 10. Um, I would say Ryan Crotty's probably your best 12, although it's really interesting. This, um, this All Black selection group have been uh, the opportunity to develop a player into some, something with an X, someone with an X factor. You see... I've been critical of Sonny Bill Williams because I don't think that he's the best number 12 in the country. And I don't think he, he ever has been yet. And yet, the All Black Selectors are stuck with him. Um, and I've, I've shown this this loyalty to a number of players. It's not just Sonny Bill. I mean, Tuonga Fassi is another example of that, where they see greater upside than the norm if they can get the best out of this player. And I think that's why they've been so patient with him. And in my view, he played better than he's played all season. Um, you know, he was more competitive. He was more abrasive. Um, you know, I thought he was up in the line a hell of a lot more in defence than he had been. He'd been a bit anonymous in the past in front on defence. So, you know, so there's probably justification for, for the selectors' uh, view on developing Sonny Bill. But Ryan Crotty, um, the best decision maker in the midfield in New Zealand probably, and um, and he's a 12, not a 13, um, most weeks. So, you know, you've got three guys in the mid midfield there that are calling the tune, really, making the decisions of what they do, when to kick, when to pass. In the weekend, on so many occasions watching the game, it appeared to me that the wrong decision was made. Even, um, you know, and Smith is reliant on, on, the, on the information coming from outside. And on one particular scrum, I... It was so obvious the ball had to go to the right-hand side, but it, there was obviously a call saying, let's go left. And uh, and he spun around and, you know, did what, what the information he'd been given asked for, you know. So uh, so that, that's sort of the way I see it. And, uh, and you know, and, and I guess Henson's trying to develop two or even three players 
in every position. And, and you know, he even made that statement um, when the team was announced. He said, you know, there's, there's, we've named this squad of 37. I'm calling it a team of 37 because anyone can play at any stage because Test Match Rugby does make the boys stand out amongst the men, you know, or make the men stand out amongst the boys. It sort of sorts out the pecking order and probably that Test Match in the weekend probably help them sort out, you know, their first, second and third options in each position um, to a degree. I mean, but, but Hanson has said, you know, Test Match Rugby in the past has shown to be a great way of developing players, and I agree. You can only see, you know, how good a player is when he's, when he's under real pressure playing against the best. That's when you assess how good he is, not when they win by 70 points and everybody's great. Um, and he said our objectives for this tour you know, how to play attractive rugby. Well, good on them because you've got to have a um, a confidence and a positive mindset if you're going to play that the sort of game they've been playing. So that's where they start. And he said it's an opportunity, number two, an opportunity to develop and expose players to test match rugby and see who can perform at this level and, and um, you know, persistently and consistently. Um, and number three, of course, is to enjoy touring the Northern Hemisphere different cultures, different way of life and spreading the gospel, you know, which is what they've done really well. So so I think it's a, a bigger picture actually will develop because of that test match. Mix with us, the Iran's Insight, Murray Mix did on a Monday. This is a Tuesday, of course, 926, but not where he is on the DRS. So are we now is sort of accepting that every four years, there's six weeks, which is the be-all and end-all of world rugby, and the in-between years are more development years. I mean, am I going to the extreme on this? I'm talking about the World Cup is the only thing that matters. No, I don't think so, Martin. I think, you know, you can... you can, I can see how you can make that comment, but I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's aiming towards the World Cup. That'll be in the back of their mind, for sure. It's more aiming towards having a replacement if a player is injured, if a player goes overseas... If a player is unavailability for one, unavailable for one reason or another, it's to have sufficient cover at the top line to maintain this unbelievable role of success that this All Black team has had over the last decade. It's um, you know quite wonderful, and and that's what the plan is. I mean, you know, touring the Northern Hemisphere and playing against France, who have been better in the last hundred years, and playing against Scotland and playing against Wales. You know, is this a time to develop players? I think it is, because I think it's a tear down from playing against South Africa and Australia. Um, you know, and I, I will say, though, that South Africa is not, not as competitive as it was, um, you know, uh, in the last two or three or four or five years, I suppose it is. They've been a hell of a lot less consistent. In fact, the last 10 years have been less consistent than they were in the past. But it's still an opportunity against those teams. Remember, they're not playing England. Uh, they're playing a couple of bar bar matches. So what a great opportunity to try a couple of players. You know, because some players some players have natural gifts. I mean Via Fafit is one of them. Um, you know, but you've got to weigh that up against the, the weaknesses um you know of his game and at the moment it's probably work rate and but he's got a sort of an ability to to do something that very few other rugby athletes have. Uh, so you've got to try and grow this guy in the areas of uh, contribution and other parts of the game. And these are the sort of things that that they'll do on this tour. And then by the end of the tour, they'll know whether they've got... Out of, out of those 37 players, they'll know the guys that they'll want to pick next year. They'll next be ready finally, to go next year. And finally, before you go, so where, where did you watch it and how weird is that? Because watching overseas is always a completely different experience. You've got different people around you. It's a different time of the day. It's hard to kind of lock in sometimes. Where were you? Well, I'm in Hawaii, actually, at the moment. Um, I've been doing some work in the U.S. Um, because it is uh, a growing market over there. There's no doubt about that. And uh, there's a lot of resource going into the Sevens game, which they understand more easily than 15s. But remember, the, um, the game of rugby has been around a long time in the United States. It's just that uh, it modif- they modified their game um, with you know protective clothing uh, back in 1928, I think it was. It might have been 1930 and, uh, and developed American football and that took the shine off. But the game of rugby is expanding all over the world and it is in the United States as well. So I've been doing some work over here, but at the moment I'm in Hawaii actually and I've... Uh, just uh, having a bit of a family holiday, really. But it was really difficult to find the game on American television. 
they don't uh, they don't see All Black rugby. I mean, you know, the All Black team is not known in this part of the world, rugby world, as much as it is all the rest of the world. So I had to stream. I had to get. I had to go online and, and stream the match. Actually, I was going to ask uh, you. You see, because that. that is now. Uh, for the Northern Hemisphere Tour, Sky going to start, and this is the first, I think, steps towards allblacktv.com. 25 bucks to stream an all-black test. Would you pay that? Well, I think, you know, when you're travelling around like me, I mean, I've been using this thing called Rugby Pass because um, yep. we were in Malaysia yep. 10 days ago, um, and Rugby Pass worked beautifully, live streaming there, and it said, uh, I tried to get it here in the US, and... Uh, and it's, it claims to be all over the world, except the US. <laughs> well, I think it's about ring fencing. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how that works. Yeah, yeah. But you saw it fine yeah. On, yeah, on the stream, and it didn't. And it didn't drop out on you or anything. Now and again, you know, when you get a bit of a Wi-Fi flick, um, you, you sort of it goes blank for a while there. But um, no, it was pretty good actually, and uh, I was able to see the thing as uh, in, in the manner in which I wanted to see it, to see what they do, do and what decision making um, you know would be apparent during this game that was the thing I was most interested in actually is the, the decisions of when to pass and when to run um, and you know we clearly got beaten in the backs not in the forwards in that game I thought our forwards played really really well actually um, so you know it's uh, it's interesting isn't it